So uh, welcome everybody to our final uh, lecture. Thank you for taking the time and joining this um, live uh, uh, lecture number six. And thank you also for uh, uh, watching it uh, later on whenever you can. So our final lecture of this economic geography and sustainability. So next week, we don't have a lecture. You can uh, use the time to, to start on your, on your essay and uh, write to me um, an email if you if you would like to to share your idea and if you like my feedback and uh, the forthcoming uh, deadline is next uh, next week it's important that you all send me your your topic idea until until next week the eight some of you already have done that and then uh, i will uh, try to reply certainly i will reply uh, even briefly to all of you that are um, inquired about the topic until the 15th of um, december and then we'll have the of course the christmas break and the seminar uh, days that this will be organized later on and i will be in touch via OLAD or or via or via email so today is our last lecture, last lecture. I think two topics that are uh, really trendy currently within economic geography, innovation policies, and um, and also uh, built uh, very nicely with the previous lectures, both of them. And these are mission-oriented innovation policies and uh, some alternative ways of uh, uh, talking, uh, speaking, uh, doing researching, uh, uh, doing research within uh, sustainability transitions. That is the concept of uh, degrow. And if time allows, then I will also touch upon the importance of the European uh, Union Green uh, Deal in this, in this regarding. So the recording is on. The slides are being shared on site here. So I'll recap the previous lecture, uh, which then somehow builds uh, towards the final um, final two concepts within economic geography. And here I touch upon that, do not be uh, 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 slaves of your thoughts and the concern of really attaching to these economic geography concepts in your essays. It is important to have economic dimension. I've been mentioning to this on my replies. Uh, and it's important if you, if you indeed bring an economic geography concept, if you are uncomfortable with them, do not uh, 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 give up uh, just yet. If you present a sustainable cohesive story on a sustainability dimension, touching upon social economic aspects, this will already be uh, uh, certainly enough for your essay. As import it's important to bring this coherent uh, and build a storyline within um, a, a sustainability dimension that can, to some extent, fill or a gap in practice, a gap in research, and that that you find in, and you find also interesting and motivates you to explore uh, further on. So then we'll carry on with mission-oriented TICRO and European Green Deal. Trying to, in two slides, summarize the previous lecture without investing too much time to see if we can really go through to the end of the of this planning uh, of the planning of this lecture. So we talk about social responsibility and spatial responsibility, part of the corporate activities of large corporations, of small firms, of enterprises. They are both based on voluntary commitments from these corporations. In the social responsibility is a more uh, an individualistic act of the corporation that builds their own reports or plans in terms of corporate social responsibility. They often do, the, do this targeting the employees or targeting the customers or targeting the surrounding communities where they are located and uh, or targeting a, a support uh, to, the, to the overall uh, environment, uh, ecological uh, dimension in this sense of the, of the, in the surrounding area. And uh, the idea of the corporate social responsibility is that they embrace seriously, the corporations embrace the responsibility and integrate that responsibility in their business model. So what they do somehow reflects what they are promising. Sometimes when they promise something and then they are really not delivering what they are promising, it's called the greenwashing. We went through a number of examples, many other examples around our our uh, uh, around our economic landscape in everyday life we may encounter this greenwashing effect in a number of uh, of activities and um, the most commonly sectors uh, of activity 
uh, where corporate social responsibility is often uh, problematic and, and requires a lot of critical thinking are those related with um, agricultural production, uh, production of, uh, of commodity crops, coffee beans, beef production, and then all the the, the supply chain involving the beef production, soybean production, and the impacts on the deforestation. And we have a number of large corporations, global corporations in this regarding, with strong, very nicely developed social responsibility plans, acts, or, or, or reports, and they often fail to deliver, to deliver what they promise. The spatial responsibility is, as the name says, a more focus on the geographical dimension of a spatial specific uh, context of an urban region, of, of a larger region in, in embracing different um, cities and rural areas. It's also about a voluntary commitment of uh, multiple enterprises here, not in an isolated manner, but a number of enterprises that uh, join forces, procedures, and knowledge to support the development of the, the community the region, the urban area, the rural area where they are uh, located. They often do th this through uh, commitments with the other organizations, they create former or informal institutions that, uh, that then play a role in improving infrastructures, in supporting housing uh, availability and uh, mainly in social uh, in social housing. They also have some role in terms of place making. These are more smaller scale interventions in the urban realm, such as urban gardening, urban farming, and supporting a number of uh, cultural activities within their locations. There are a few examples yet in the literature, most of them in Germany, as well as the Nordic countries. And in both cases, this, this corporate, uh, the, the corporate social responsibility and special responsibility are also very much interlinked with, with the reputation of the brands of these corporations. In the case of corporate social responsibility, there's an acknowledgement that supporting the local communities where they are embedded, they're supporting, for example, the green infrastructures, is also uh, plays a role in the attractiveness of the region and therefore uh, in boosts the capacity of these firms, these enterprises to attract labor force, for example, that they want to find a job, but also find a job in a location that offers good quality transportation, good quality education and health infrastructures, as well as green, infra, green infrastructures urban parks and recreational areas. So uh, most of them um, of activities within corporate social responsibility, they have the aim of investment or attracting investment, support infrastructure uh, developments, and uh, they also play a role in organizing cultural and social events. Um, and this is, is one way of having these corporations engaging with the development of, of uh, territories and eventually support their sustainability and addressing uh, uh, some of the sustainable development goals. There are many other concepts within economic geography uh, doing, uh, doing or acting in this regard. And one of these concepts, one that I found very relevant to bring in, in such a model of economic geography and sustainability is this one mainly developed by Mariana Mazzucato and that is called mission-oriented innovation policies. The genesis of the concept is older than the publications I have shared with you at the OLAD and those slides I bring to you, but the essence lies on the on these uh, on these publications by Mariana Mosucat, and they summarize very specifically what it entails to do a mission-oriented innovation policy or to make. Uh, if we are talking about policy making to make a, a mission oriented innovation policy and this aligns with everything we have been discussing uh, in this uh, in the previous lectures and this essential about this integrative integrated approach towards uh, the operationalization of the sustainable development goals the mission oriented innovation policy as you will see is about addressing these grand societal challenges you probably have been hearing and reading and studying about these grand challenges across all your um, uh, courses within the, within the master so this is about innovating in a way that helps to or supports low personalization of the sustainable development goals and in some cases i will be reading it the, the, the slides as they reflect the literature and the, the literature underlines 
the concept to the maximum extent and in the simple words, uh, I believe. So the mission oriented innovation policy responds to this or, or, or the idea is to respond to these grand challenges, identifies and tries to articulate the problems and tries to engage differently uh, or, or in an alternative manner to the main activities that characterize an economic geography, that is production, distribu distribution, and a consumption pattern. So it's about, it's about looking at these elements within the economic geography that can be somehow reshaped, reframed, and then help to operationalize uh, the sustainable development goals and address these grand challenges. Um, by doing this, the mission-oriented innovation policy or the principles of it, sometimes I underlined this earlier on, we are talking about circular economy, slow innovation, and you are reading the, the, the literature and you don't see, okay, this is an interesting case in slow innovation, but I don't see slow innovation written here. Maybe the principles are there. Uh, uh, sometimes there's a question about how authors want to position themselves in the discussion. They may don't talk about straight away and slow innovation, but the principles of slowness, of emphasizing the local, on uh, on on uh, using uh, uh, using uh, consolidated knowledge, they are embedded in that in that research. The same happens with mission oriented innovation policies. So it's acknowledged or, or, or doing that means not only valuing uh, economic indicators requires valuing something more and requires entering a different direction in comparison to a more classic standardized economic approach. And when we talk about innovation within this mission oriented is essential about the risk taking because, because of the novelty, not only of the concept, but to do something different requires risk taking, uh, being unsure about the outcome those that embrace such type of innovation it certainly are aware that maybe the outcomes will be different than what they are initially planning so it involves this risk taking along the way to do this risk taking and in most of the cases these innovation policies they do not happen in isolation or do not happen through the hands of only one entrepreneur or one investor or one or one institution from the public uh, public sector, for example, but is are the result of a co-creation or if you want co-production. So involves a number of actors, including public and private that come together to do the things precisely differently than like uh, uh, an economic mainstream uh, approach. It's a lot about, and along the way, it's about experimenting. So the risk taking also involves experimentation, involves learning along the way and involves, involves a lot of bottom-up initiatives uh, that doing this experimentation at the local level is often, uh, it involves risk-taking but is less risky in terms of the impacts that can generate and nothing. These missions cannot truly uh, take shape without consensus building within the society. That's what Mariana Mazzucato underlines. And a lot of what we uh, have encountered in the past and then we are encountering uh, today in terms, for example, energy transition in many countries worldwide, not only in Europe, elsewhere, uh, are the results of this mission oriented. So the, the, they, they call the, the mission to put the man on the moon can be, can be called the mission oriented uh, 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 intervention or, or, or action in this, in this regard. And for this mission to occur, that's the essence of the slide here, uh, it required the development, it requires the co-evolution of a number of activities. So required innovation in aeronautics, in robotics, in textiles, in nutrition as well. So a number of sectors uh, had to support this mission and the same happens today with this mission-oriented innovation policy. So to truly implement, uh, let's say, Germany as the mission of providing clean energy in the, in the next 20 or 30 years, and it doesn't matter here much the here, but to fulfill this mission, they, re, they they need the support of a number of sectors, including, for example, the, 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 the transportation of energy, the grid needs to improve uh, the, 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 the infrastructures in our cities, for example, electric cars, they also need to be uh, built and enhanced strongly. So then in the, the, this mission to transform transform the, the energy landscape in Germany can really take shape at a, at a, at a ground. So 
Working one mission requires the involvement of a different, of multiple partners and the involvement of uh, multiple sectors. All the missions, they need to have a sense of direction, energy transition, okay, the, the, the goal is, or the direction they want to follow is clean energy, is to only use resources to produce energy that are clean, that, that have a lowest environmental footprint as possible. And this requires having some specific objectives. However, these are two domains of, that require some specificity and being very much concrete about. A mission oriented does not uh, uh, difficulty take shape without experimentation and failure in this regarding. So it requires experimenting different alternatives to see what it works and what does not work. And this will certainly involve also failures and consumption of resources, but without this experimentation, won't be possible a mission to be completely uh, fulfilled. So these specific objectives are uh, essential and uh, are essential to, to, to shape the mission innovation. It's about trying something new. It's also about continuing experimenting until something in concrete actually unfolds or occurs. It is maybe, maybe very, very, not that complex, but difficult to grasp here that, that that this is this is really not a sprint. This is more as a as a marathon. A mission orient does not happen from the day to the night. It requires it requires a, a long process of experimentation, of integrating different type of technologies, of adjusting institutions sometimes. So it's about the social technical dimension that we talked about earlier on and with the sustainability transitions, and this to happen usually occurs at the bottom level as. Is, is, is some uh, a scale easier to manage in this regarding and to grasp what is uh, uh, what is um, what, what can can be more successful in comparison to other ways of um, of dealing with production consumption and distribution of uh, of uh, products or services uh, and essence mission oriented is about using resources smartly in a sustainable manner and is about valuing uh, the local. And I often talk about the research that has been doing in this regard, and still a gap remains on slow innovation case studies. A gap remains in terms of incentives to support uh, circular economy, for example. It's not, yeah, I tend to focus more on the on the research domain, but most of these topics we have been addressing in the past six, five lectures and the lectures today, they are also uh, part of a, a policy making discourse, and not not only a discourse, but also. Uh, they also work in support of real policies, and Mariano Mozucat has been involved greatly in uh, in supporting this mission-oriented scheme, more focused on research and innovation from the European Union. But uh, countries integrating the OECD, OECD, they also uh, came together to prepare a mission-oriented innovation policy. So, in terms of policies, this mission-oriented, they are also uh, uh, gaining, then gaining some strength in um, how to uh, somehow transform the domain of research and uh, innovation and technology in a way that can uh, be problem-solved, that can address and support the operationalization of the sustainable uh, development goals. And although these two examples in terms of policies are European centered, so they mainly focus on, on, on European cases, mission oriented uh, innovation policies, even not necessarily in this specific terminology, but the principles of it, of failing the local, of being, being uh, so much focused on addressing some specific issues, can be found elsewhere in the world. We have a case of Japan here with a moonshot program with specific objectives, valuing local resources, enhancing the, the consensus building about uh, involving different actors. The robot program in South Korea, indeed, the, the uh, mission oriented to, to support um, uh, um, cancer treatments in the European Union. Uh, Different, different, uh, in different other programs and other in other European Union member states, uh, Germany, France, and as well as uh, in the um, in the United States with a mission of preventing or be, or making the country more resilient to pandemics, for example. So there are a number of uh, yet yet under development. Uh, mission-oriented innovation uh, policies across uh, across the world, both uh, in the in the 
in the in the northern hemisphere and also as well as in the and in the south and it is somehow uh, uh, difficult to to analyze in one uh, in one lecture slide but this part of the share of the of the share of publications and the, these results of the, the European Union mission oriented project they underline some of the case studies that are embracing these mission oriented principles and somehow what I want to underline with this slide is the methodology they often follow here a, a common methodology they as you see I have been mentioning is, is necessary to specifically focus on 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 the mission, on a goal. And uh, in the case of this mission or driven top sector policy in the Netherlands, they specifically focus on four grand challenge and then 25 missions. So they make this as specific as possible at the outset of the of the of the policy. And all of them they they do this, they point out here their specific goals. The in the case of this in Sweden, they want to address sustainable development goals in four areas. Norway, they want to uh, they are focused on a scheme in a sustainable energy area by grouping of three agencies. So they clearly set their their uh, aims here, set their missions and the ways and how to get there. So they they will point out a number of actors here that need to be developed, involved. They will point out a number of strategies that need to be set up to support and the operationalization towards the end. They underline here the cool design, so it means the, 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 the collaborative designing process can also be called co-creation until that they reach somehow a more concrete action plan to really support everything else that goes along this, um, this uh, methodological diagram on how to, uh, to prepare a mission-oriented uh, policy. So as you may expect from this, these examples, doing a mission-oriented requires uh, touching upon the, the, what they call the, the uh, touch upon or draw from the frontier of knowledge is, is important that the countries, that the multinationals, uh, corporations, governments, supranational organizations such as the European Union, OECD, the World Bank, they come together, they share their knowledge and their, 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 the knowledge that we can consider ultimate one in terms of, of addressing grand societal challenges to truly support their respective missions. This can be, for example, in making the economy more greener or supporting the, supporting the energy transition at the global scale and not only in specific countries. Uh, at the end, the overarching goal of these two concepts, we are exploring the lecture, mission-oriented innovation policy and the D concept of the grow. Ultimately, the goal is support the quality of life of the citizens. If this is reached, means that certainly they will have, they will have jobs, uh, they will have quality infrastructures, they will have uh, access to the prime services, this in a most equitable manner as possible. These are the principles attached to the concept, making them operationalize it in practice, it's certainly more challenging as it is, for example, operationalizing the circular economy or the principles of, of uh, slow innovation. And uh, for this to take shape, the same happens with the concepts we talked about earlier, they have to be integrated in policy, in the policy agendas. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's certainly very attractive and, and often they tend to be buzzwords across media, different type, different channels of media. Uh, but it's important that these concepts, uh, as they, they as research on the background reveals that they can uh, they can be effective in addressing some specific challenge and supporting the quality of life, they have they they need to be integrated in innovation policy agendas across across sectors and across governance levels from nationals to supranational, regional and local levels of jurisdiction as well. So from Mazzucato, a number of highlights here in terms of uh, a more conceptual, conceptual approach to the mission, mission-oriented mission innovation uh, policies. And Mazzucato underlines that missions should be well-defined. This is, is an essence to really set up a target and, and define how to get there. This needs to be well-defined since the beginning. And um, and to get there, as I underlined earlier, it's necessary research and development in the in the in the multiple sectors in different domains, because to really achieve a mission in a, in a, even one with one or two specific grand challenges in mind, or, or, or as as the goal requires the involvement of different of different sectors. Uh, 
They should result in investment across these different sectors and involve different type of actors, including universities, research centers, policymakers in different sectors of activity. So if grand societal change, they are interlinked, the aging of the population is interlinked with, with the health sector, climate change is certainly interlinked with reducing the environmental footprint of the industry, different actors, they need to come together and all of this needs to be done with the support of policy making. Um, there are arguments in favor, in favor of having the private sector taking a role in this type of innovation policies or Often within innovation, when we are talking about innovation, often the private actors play a role in this domain. Mariana Mazzucato, also author of the Entrepreneurial State, that, that publication that underlines the role of public authorities in innovation processes, touch upon that the public sector, they need, need to be involved so a mission-oriented innovation policy can truly be operationalized. A couple of examples here to see if we can all together grasp these mission-oriented policies. So this conceptual part uh, being a result of a consensus building, bringing different actors together, engaging research across different uh, sectors of activity, requires a culture of experimentation, of risk-taking, and certainly embracing failure in this regard is essential to, to until, until a mission can truly achieve its aims. So Mariana Mazzucato provides here a framework that can then be, be implemented in different, uh, in different domains or to address different challenges. So it's interesting that, that uh, the value of such a work is when, when we have this more conceptualized framework and can be then generalized to different uh, different sectors. I found this very interesting, a simplified framework here that puts as the, the grand challenge at the top. So the mission is to support addressing these, uh, these grand challenges and operationalize the sustainable development goals. So we can have one or different missions together supporting these, uh, these grand challenges. They need to have clear target missions. That's the main here of the of the Harris, they need political engagement, they need to engage policy makers, they need to engage the citizens as well, public and private actors, and they require experimentation often after, often at the bottom level. Often this occurs through the lenses of mission projects, for example, where these experimentations take shape uh, within a, a more controlled environment somehow. And then uh, here, the, the, the essence is this, this uh, requires um, an innovation across systems. So it's not easy to implement a mission-oriented uh, innovation policy, for example, more traditional uh, geographies where there is somehow a, a well-defined process of innovation and the money goes from the government to research centers or universities and they target specifically industry, the textile sector, the automobile sector, the agriculture sector. So it requires the, a wider involvement of an innovation system. So different sectors here, they need to be placed in between the bottom uh, the bottom of the of the framework in the mission projects, different sectors they need to be involved. So to truly achieve a mission-oriented innovation policy requires the involvement of the overarching uh, innovation system within one specific um, specific region. The example that's come up. So uh, the, the, another example will come up soon. This, this system innovation is, is, is central on, on achieving the, the, the emission oriented. And, and this simply underlines what I've been talking to you earlier on, requires involvement of different actors. These different actors, they do not only share their knowledge as we've been talking about, but they really bring their hands together to co-design, co-create these different mission projects. So, so they really play a role in, in, the, in, the, in building this mission, these mission projects that, that they know at the, at, the, at, the, at the start, as a starting point, the specific mission they want to, um, to achieve. So it requires this involvement of the, of the whole system innovation. And here I bring an example that underlines this, this uh, involvement of different sectors and, uh, and how was an innovation system needed to, to, to or, or evolve through time to, um, to, 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 to support, for example, the automobile sector. And then we'll have an example of a more domain, more related with the, sustain with the sustainability 
part. So, and the, and the, the, the authors here underline that you know, to sustain one activity, we can have two types, incremental innovation, though that goes more in an organic manner or a disrupting innovation. And here we have the automobile sector. So we have in the disruptive innovation, something that happens quite recently, the introduction of hydrogen cars, lithium batteries, for example. But for these to, to, to really, uh, uh, we can call them, they are bringing some more sustainability um, principles to the automobile sector for these to happen requires an adaptation of the business models. It also requires uh, an improvement in terms of the infrastructures. It certainly also requires a regulatory framework and the change of behavior of ourselves as a citizen. So indeed, within the innovation part, the technological innovation, the cars evolved from, from, from what, what we, we know cars using only uh, fossil fuel resources to electrical vehicles or hydrogen vehicles. Then there are a number of, of, uh, of improvements in terms of business models, some of them within the principles of circular economy, such as car sharing, but also to, so, so for this innovation here to really uh, achieve its aims requires also an improvement in terms of the system. So the mobility system, the, the, the charging stations, all of these components need to be improved so that the, um, the automobile sector can turn, can transition towards a more sustainable, uh, sustainable oriented, uh, as a more sustainable oriented activity. There are many other uh, several other uh, examples and uh, most of those more, more, uh, um, the, the mo most of those more emblematic are uh, related within the food system or the agriculture production. And here we have a case that I came across very recently. Actually, it was a colleague of yours that uh, called my attention to, uh, to this article in the exploration of the seaweed that and how uh, uh, the, the exploration of the seaweed or seaweed cultivation called then support support different or various sustainable the personalization of the sustainable development goals. But before this to happen requires the partnerships, the involvement of business, the governments, and certainly the academia in terms of, of research. So ultimate mission here is to integrate seaweed into the food system. While doing this, Research is necessary. It's necessary to uh, to found this research. Governments they need to be engaged. Certainly, the business sectors need to find utility, and eventually see the activity uh, of production seaweed as profitable. But while doing that, we certainly will have some improvements in terms of uh, the ecosystem services, in terms of. Uh, boosting science and education, and in certainly boosting also the food system. And while doing this, different um, sustainable development goals will be uh, achieved directly and with benefits towards others. And then within this mission-oriented innovation policies, you can bring principles of slow innovation, you can bring the principles of sustainability transitions or a governance of, you can explore governance of these sustainability transitions, understanding who is involved, or also circular economy, as these authors also point out here, that's ideal or ultimately, instead of having this linear process of of having a number of structures supporting the production of seaweed, then ultimately the seaweed will enter the circular process of utilization with benefits in terms of uh, um, um, emission of nutrients into, into, the, into the ecosystem in general. So there are a number of ad advantages, we don't call competitive advantage, but gains while embracing uh, such uh, mission-oriented uh, uh, mission innovation policies. There are some direct gains in terms of economic activity, in terms of engaging with different, uh, different sectors of activity. It certainly boosts, for example, employment and economic activity in general, but again also generates positive effects upon, for example, mitigating the climate change or supporting the resilience of uh, uh, marine ecosystems. That's what is underlined here in this part of the uh, publication. Mariana Mosacat underlines the, the, the goal or the mission of, uh, of having a plastic-free ocean. And this is a very intuitive and, and quite straightforward uh, framework here that underlines the goal of this mission-oriented. So to achieve that, 
requires research and innovation and different mission-oriented projects. Ultimate, the ultimate goal is to support life below water, but then this will have gains across multiple, multiple uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Mission here at the top, clean oceans. And uh, for that, we have a sub-mission somehow or an intermediate mission of having a plastic-free ocean. So we have a clearly defined mission with clearly defined goals here. And, and what is important also, Mariana Lines, is the time bound. It's important to do this, to have a specific aim, but also set a time frame. So then this can, 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 can uh, this, this, uh, this process can be evolved, assessed, and eventually new interventions can occur to improve or the, the how to get there, to improve, to improve the path towards reaching a clean oceans. This is certainly of societal relevance. If this is truly achieved, a plastic-free ocean will have impact on marine life, on the on the on the human health. It, it requires certainly involvement of the waste management sector. So we'll have a societal relevance. Relevance is important to be ambitious, but also have these uh, realistic uh, realistic goals. And the realistic goals often occur here at the bottom with these mission projects. And then for them to also to occur involves a number of flows of knowledge, exchange of practices involved different type of, um, of, um, of uh, sectors, as well as the, their, their capacity on dealing with them with the, the certain technologies and how to do research to address this specific um, this specific mission. So in the case of the plastic free ocean will require an intervention of uh, from the packaging uh, uh, packaging sector, for example, it uh, it will involve certainly a lot of the industry that deals or uses plastic to place their products in the market. It, it involves production, it involves also the consumption, it involves also a number of structures now to to support recycling, for example, or supporting the alternative uses of other packaging uh, uh, products to avoid the, to avoid the use of uh, of plastic and then to avoid ultimately the plastic to be dropped or to end up in the in our ocean. So, here uh, a diagram explaining uh, or giving an example of this mission oriented uh, or mission oriented uh, innovation policy of a plastic free ocean somehow simplify it but then the how to get that is certainly much more complex and this slide here underlines this complexity uh, and and then to truly get uh, address this grand challenge of plastic free oceans so it's important to have the time frame in this regarding and it is important to 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 come up with a mission oriented that's the blue frames here mission oriented projects that will bring together all these actors the policy sector the private sector throughout here to truly support the mission of a clean uh, uh, plastic free ocean and i see this as a as, a, as a, having a, a tremendous potential in toward, towards the future. And it's very interesting that uh, these uh, supernatural entities such as the European Union are embracing a mission-oriented innovation policy. The question here is about, in my perspective, is very much about raising awareness about uh, the importance of, uh, of having a clearly defined goals and setting these targets and also bringing uh, the public and private actors to work together to have this consensus building is certainly very challenging in countries with a more uh, centralized government structure, for example, with a strong culture of, of authority. So it's difficult to have this, this more this governance approach uh, based on formal and informal commitments and consensus. That is certainly, it's certainly very difficult and a long way until we can have this mission-oriented innovation policies somehow being at the, at the top of the overarching innovation policies of governments and supranational uh, entities. So just before hitting the break here, um, I open the, the floor for debate. Do you have uh, questions on the mission-oriented innovation policy? Have you heard about it before or, or you came across of it in other lectures, for example? Just feel free to, to come up with, uh, with some thoughts on this. Then, um, then if not, I think it's a good moment to do a, to do a short break here, as before, and then we'll continue with a, 
with a degrow, uh, and we'll see. We'll try to see how uh, this degrow aligns also with the sustainability transitions, and very much keeps emphasizing this uh, everything we have been talking about earlier on on the bottom-up initiatives, valuing local, value local resources, and uh, and bringing different actors um, actors together. Okay, so still, uh, any question from the audience here? Okay, so um, let's do here a, a ten minute, uh, ten minutes break, and uh, I will see you after that for the second part of the lecture. Right, so we are back to the second part of our final lecture and we'll be talking about uh, Degro. So, you know, let's feel free to intervene if you uh, would like to intervene at any moment. Uh, raise your hands, I will um, check it time to time uh, as well. And uh, I think the, the publication I shared with you, uh, um, published in the Journal of Clean, um, Cleaner Air Production, it really touched upon some of the essential elements of TIGRO. It brings the definition quite straightforward, how it starts, how it is going, and how it links with sustainability transitions. And it is a concept that, uh, in my perspective, really builds and bridges all the concepts we have been talking about earlier. It's still very much ongoing in terms of research and integration in policy making as well. And I will be also reading parts of this article to underline the definition of um, uh, Degro. It first starts as a social movement and um, with a prime goal of, of trying to steering the economic development in a different direction in comparison to more classic or mainstream economic development uh, processes. It also uh, emerged as somehow as a re repoliticized debates about socio environmental futures, an example of an activist led science now consolidated in a concept in academic uh, literature. The publications are coming up from different, uh, different domains economic geography, sociology, spatial planning when it comes to planification of, uh, of um, urban regions, for example. And um, some of them, they are more. Uh, um, they 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 build and find because more in the conceptualization, other in some of the in some uh, case studies, and from this more more activist uh, reactionary uh, social movement enter this uh, political or start entering this political discourse and academic research. Here the essential is to, so the cause to repoliticize, and in my interpretation is cause to 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 understand the social economic and environmental development as part of the common good, part of what it should be a concern of the public of public entities. It emerged and hit as in a sense against the hegemonic principles of economic development. And here the authors underline the underline it uh, underline this what I've been telling you, uh, sharing with you very, very concretely. The push for substantial transformation towards a sustainable society closely links to the concept of Tigro, which calls for a radical different organization of modern society and the economy. So in a sense, it's about a reorganization of the economic landscape. There are, again, different publications, some of them more critical than the others, some that still still contesting very much not only the, this mainstream capitalistic approach to economic development, but they also point out the possible failures of embracing the philosophical principles of degrow in economic developments. They also touch upon that it may work well already in advanced societies or high income countries of the north and may work less or less effectively in the low or middle income countries of, of the south. So the idea of uh, this uh, um, Degrow is very much attached to the to the to a social sustainable degrow. So uh, so embracing growth in economic terms that is essentially social sustainable and at the end is about putting people at the center of the economic development instead of embracing only a profit oriented a, a grow in the perspective of 
going from a smaller firm to a large globalized corporation. It is also about slowing down the patterns of the economic and cultural globalization. And these are two of the researchers uh, that often embrace a more critical approach towards the, the organization of the economic landscape. And they start exploring the concept and the principles of um, they grow as an alternative to the to the traditional to the more classic economic models of um, of um, of development, and uh, in the more practical terms, uh, is is uh, is um, is about the grow is about is is to operationalize the grow. The ordi grow is operationalized through different types of alternatives in the organization of the of the economic landscape, and this is quite. Quite, quite essential also in the mission-oriented uh, policies about alternatives and, and finding those alter these alternatives requires experimentation. The same still happens with, with Degro is, is the author. The principles or in the conceptual terms is not a novel uh, concept, but the way that has been, has been approached in practice is still rather novel and is essential about finding um, alternatives to economic development. And there are a component of this degree that is more focused on the on the understanding the environmental goods as a as part of the common uh, common domain of the society and this will certainly require a completely change in terms of production consumption and distribution of uh, of uh, products and uh, and uh, and service across uh, the economic landscape is about understanding the ecological impacts of the economic activity and finding alternatives to minimize the environmental impact of these economic activities on the, on the ecosystems essentially. Other component is more focused on the, is more social oriented than other component of the group, is more concerned about providing a, a, equitable environments uh, to the workforce in providing and respecting human rights within globalized supply chains and is also essential about uh, downsizing the, the overall uh, economic uh, the economic the, the downsizing the supply chains involving different types of uh, of our activities means bringing these supply chains to a more regionalized context in, instead of having these uh, global uh, across the world supply chains involving, for example, textile or agriculture uh, products, which, as you may understand, is certainly very challenging and it will involve different power relations. Eventually, it will involve some also less clear activities. Uh, we all know that this uh, private uh, and uh, private actors play a strong role in the organization of the economic landscape and uh, raising awareness of the need to do the things differently and doing the things in a more sustainable manner. manner it, it is uh, certainly very challenging to bring different actors to share this common understanding. And how does go along? I'll allow me to to read another another highlights here of the of the paper. So the main idea of the growth movement is to downsize the global and national economies fairly and those reduce the ecological footprint to a sustainable level. Such downsizing must be voluntary and democratic with an emphasis on social and environmental justice. So most of the degrowth uh, uh, is focused on the social and environmental uh, domains and for it to be successful, the authors uh, in their literature review, touch upon that needs to be voluntary and embedded in the democratic principle. So this is very, very much an essence of every, every kind of sustainability transition. I believe that I mentioned this to, to you earlier. It's important to do the things in a way that, 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 that um, avoid clashes with the embed democratic principle. So, if we want our our societies to behave in a more sustainable way, for example, in terms of consumption of 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 um, of, of, of clothing, for example, coming up with measures that somehow sound an imposition, it certainly goes against the governance principles that we are all very familiar with and 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 live within. So it's important to seek a balance, and this is. I believe the key challenges involving all these concepts we have been talking about, including circular economy, for example, which we can all put in the realm of sustainability transitions. The ones uh, of concept of Tigro 
here aligns very much with the sustainability transitions as we also defined in, the, in our previous lectures. And at the end, uh, DIGRO is also about uh, strong structural changes within the countries across different sectors involving the policy sector, transportation sector, the industrial sector, the consumption sector as well. It's certainly to take shape requires a change of, uh, uh, of various domains. And before going to the table number one of the publication, the one that I will reflect here and I is, as the, is, is, a, is the, a key of uh, to understand degrow, uh, I underline again what the authors call here that the objective of degrow are to meet basic human needs and ensure a high quality of life. It certainly is a, a very ambitious goal. But as Mariano Mazzocato says in the Mission Oriented Innovation Policy, uh, these high ambitions, they are important to hold on to have these missions anchored in, um, in the, within the society. While reducing the ecological impact of the global economy to a sustainable level, equitable distributed between nations. So it's is, is necessary to really embrace the sustainable pattern of development, but also secure that this downsizing, downscaling is done in an equitable manner. And different uh, um, actors within the society, mainly the citizens, mainly the labor force, they are truly involved in a transition process, being this more close to the growth, being this more close to the circular economy, being this more close to slow innovation uh, processes. So I will not go, you, you have the publication with you and then the slides. I just try to underline here some of the keys, these key aspects that the, the, the authors point out. So it's about, the degree is certainly about finding alternative value systems. They tell that it's not necessarily doing different, not only less, but it also in, in, it entails about reducing production and consumption and changing these patterns of production and consumption. And this is certainly very challenging and aligns what, with what we discuss also within sustainability transitions. It's, it's important to understand that really a change needs to happen in this specific sectors of the economic activity, the production, but also the consumption. And again, doing this within a voluntary commitments and within democratic principles is certainly very challenging. And they emphasize that the crisis that is going on uh, currently, economic, not necessarily the, the, the um, COVID-19 crisis, the economic crisis, the environmental crisis, both are the result of the organization of the economic landscape rooted in the neoliberalism principles. And they all call uh, those working in Tigro that a change in this regarding is needed. So, and from, from being a simple movement, these, these principles of the growth, they also need, similar to the mission oriented, to be integrated within um, the innovation policies and within the agendas of uh, policy makers, those that, that play a role in organizing our everyday lives. That's precisely what I'm trying to point here. This very much aligns with both sustainability transitions and also with mission, uh, mission oriented. So uh, they emphasize essentially the social and environmental domain, less than the technological. Uh, the sustainability transitions emphasize more the social technical and uh, the GCRO emphasize more the social, economic, environmental nexus here. And it's, it's, it starts as a, as a part of the activism, as I said, and enter the academic literature uh, later on. And it's still very much ongoing. Is also about bottom up participation, democratic, uh, democratic uh, uh, engagement is about, uh, about valuing the local, le uh, local level, the values, the knowledge that is, is rooted within, within the local level. And is about, again, bringing the importance of conducting science in favor of the common good, in favor of the society, and relies very much on the importance of involving this grassroots uh, movements, neighborhood uh, associations, um, smaller uh, small communities 
uh, small communities that they are concerned with uh, with uh, reframing their environments in the, towards a more sustainable pattern being this for example urban gardening urban farming and different uh, different uh, interventions very much at the micro level because part of literature underlines that valuing these micro level interventions is essential to truly support a sustainability um, uh, transition and also both underline that indeed research is fundamental is important to understand science as part of the common good also politicize science but it's also important to make the scientific findings useful for for society and for the business sector it certainly is often a call a call uh, by by the entrepreneurs that attend uh, more environmental oriented uh, conferences for example they often call for the scientific findings to be to be uh, to be communicated in a manner that can somehow can be integrated within their processes of production of, of, of consumption or service delivery, for example. It's important to make science also useful for society, including the business. And um, this both, both, uh, both uh, we start the, these lectures by talking about the grand societal challenges. We then bring different kinds of concepts, different types of concepts explored within economic geography, but also explored within other disciplines uh, and how they can address uh, more uh, or how they can put the economic landscape in a more sustainable pattern of development. We talk about, uh, uh, we talk now about Tigro, we earlier talked about sustainable development, which still was still very vague. Now these this approaches somehow help to to grasp sustainable development, the mission-oriented, uh, green entrepreneurship is another domain that is often discussed within sustainability of economic geographies. We haven't touched upon that one, but it's still a, an interesting concept. It also involves a lot of risk taking, uh, uh, as well as the, the mission oriented. We talk about the spatial responsibility, circular economy, and all of this somehow the idea is to use technology, use innovation in favor of the common good to improve the quality of life of, uh, of the citizens. And while doing this, reduce the environmental or the ecological footprint of the economic activities. The Green Deal, the European Green Deal, but also the Green Deal in North America, for example, in the US and Canada, and they very much reflect uh, the principles attached to some of these uh, concepts, sustainability transitions, spatial responsibility, circular uh, economy. Before moving to the Green Deal that, that, uh, that uh, and the Green Deal within the European Union, I open the floor again for um, some debate on the, on the, on the, on the degrowth concept, if you would like to, to intervene in this, um, in this regarding. Um, while I look for something else that I think I wanted to underline here. Uh -huh. Yep. Any question? Yes. Thank you very much. It's really interesting. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I've uh, heard about uh, this concept last year and uh, was thinking how uh, to apply it uh, better for developing countries as well, since uh, they are still in a developing stage and uh, there is mm -hmm. already a lot to learn from developed countries, what is good and what is not. Of course, uh, it's um, already um, positive for them that uh, there is already uh, something to learn from, uh, how to uh, live sustainably. And uh, mm, what I mean is uh, economic justice, like uh, uh, shifting to uh, degrowth, uh, mm -hmm. would it be um, uh, like just for uh, the developing countries as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I understand the, the question. Thank you, uh, Tamina. Right to 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 bring it. It is important, and um, uh, let me do something maybe uncommon here that is uh, going off my slides. I don't think I left them here. Uh -huh, I left. Yeah, that's very good. 
Okay, that's the part I have after the conclusion. I, I will not be talking about it probably because of the of the time. So that's a part I have after the happy holidays. And this is the slide. Yeah, it was in my mind. I open it here. Okay. It is in, indeed very important to when we are talking about all sustainability transition, circular economy, this degrowth, how they can take shape in low income, middle income countries. That's the more, uh, the more uh, uh, fair way to address the global south or developing uh, new countries. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, indeed relevant and number of research and then there's a number of uh, uh, a lot of links here and all these articles they underline how somehow the advanced societies of the north, let's say Europe, North America, other advanced societies elsewhere in the world can learn from the global south. Um, they do not specifically talk about degrow, how this can happen, uh, but also based on my own experience in Mozambique, a country in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we try to underline how local approach, for example, in water management, they use their local resources to, to in water management or in waste management in a, in a small cities, for example, they can also be be a, be a used as as lessons for uh, advanced societies. And what the lessons that can be learned from the developing country is essential about how they value their local resources and how they use their knowledge in benefit of the overall interest of the community. And some of these examples they precisely underline this uh, how sustainability transitions in the south can take uh, can take shape some of them they have uh, they are supported through uh, uh, or research or founding uh, of entities based in um, in, in advanced societies such as this one in the, the netherlands but they all try to underline for example the south african food lab um, uh, stories of co-creation in uh, in Kenya and in northern Mozambique, for example. So they try to also underline the extent the global south and the develop or developing countries, if you will, uh, can also uh, or some interesting lessons can be drawn from these insights from the global south to support the overall sustainability transition at the global scale. And the question that remains within uh, within research and one that I'm also struggling with is. Okay, we talk about sustainability transitions and uh, the discourse is very much uh, preoccupied with how uh, European countries, for example, will, will embrace these sustainability transitions. And, uh, but, but then we have the, the framework of the sustainable development goals. These are global goals. So to what extent we can have a globalized discourse on sustainability transitions that truly, as you said, that is economical just or, or social fair sustainability transition framework that builds on both insights from the global north and for insights from the global south. So this, this is very much, uh, uh, this publication here underlines a number of interesting case studies that, that uh, value the local level. They are based on bottom-up initiatives and they, they are often neglected from the the discourse of sustainability transitions, but they underline they play a role or they call play a role in supporting this this global play for a sustainability transitions. But uh, and if you if you ask me what we need to do, I think we really need to emphasize more the value of uh, of uh, some of the initiatives of the global south and what we can learn. We, I mean, here in Europe, or more uh, advanced societies can learn from uh, these good examples in the south. Okay, if you, if you, I, I yeah, click on one of the links. Um, back to the presentation here, and uh, if you want to learn more about these sustainability transitions in the south, that's a part of the after the concluding the lecture and uh, and uh, if uh, if I manage the time I can do a, a complementary lecture on the sustainability transitions in the south I precisely underline here that we often often the sustainability transitions in the in the in the more advanced societies for them to really take shape require the, a lot of effort from the countries in the south they often pay the price of the sustainability transitions in the in the north or because large corporations, for example, from the pulp and paper, they localize their activities in the south, which then damage the ecosystems in there. So it's important to have the to seek the balance between uh, between uh, who pays the price of securing sustainability transitions in more advanced societies. 
And um, okay, thank you so much for your uh, intervention. And then we still have time to uh, to wrap up the lecture with a with a green deal. And the green deal is important because because it somehow will will play a role in the distribution of the European Union founding. And I'm focusing here on the green deal of on the European green deal, but. You may have heard about the Green Deal in the US as well. And then in your online platform, you have publications touching upon the importance of the Green Deal, more focused on countries outside of um, Europe than I focus on the European and Green Deal. Somehow builds on these principles of, uh, of Mariana Mozucat of the mission oriented uh, innovation policies, clearly defining goal of making uh, the European territory climate neutral by 2050. Here we have the, the time frame, and here we have the goal, climate neutral. And all, all what it comes within the Green Deal somehow can be encapsulated in this mission-oriented project, the blue uh, circles in that diagram. So it's about the climate protection, uh, mitigation of climate change, but also about economic recovery measures. And uh, somehow the this um, economic... Uh, uh, the European Green Deal somehow got disrupted because of uh, COVID-19, uh, but it's the, it is now somehow again taking a little a, a little shape more in some some uh, specific domains of uh, um, of the just uh, found and how the European Union cohesion policy found will be distributed. So the essence here is that the extent this European Green Deal will actually be able to implement some structural change and, and go in line with these principles of the DECRO, of supporting a transformation of the, of the overall system of, of the or if the countries will continue engaging with it as business as usual. In essence, the Green Deal is about putting people first, people at the center of the economic development and social progress within the European Union. It certainly pays attention to the role of the regions, more local um, local um, territories, the role of the industries, because industry still plays a dominant role in the economic landscape of the European countries and on, the, on respecting the rights of the labor force, of the workers, and will certainly become a pillar a central pillar of uh, all the European Union policies uh, from now on, 2021 towards 2027, within the multinational financial framework and further on. Four pillars of the Green Deal, carbon mitigate, mitigation, sustainable inv investment, industrial policy, again, because of the role of industry in Europe and the just transition and the just transition founding. Uh, overarching motto or, or overarching um, goal, of putting people first is often communicated through the through the message of leave no one behind, which is also aligned with the sustainable development goal. So somehow the European Green Deal helps to operationalize the 17 sustainable development goals. These are the four cornerstones of the deal. Carbon mitigation, sustainable investment, industrial policy, and the just transition. And I underline here mostly the just transition. The other somehow build on the on the on the common or more traditional, more uh, classic European Union policy or focus on industry. And this then branches out to innovation and technology. Here more uh, uh, is important to underline this novelty of the just transition founding that is precisely uh, with a precise goal of uh, indeed supporting the, the sustainability transitions across, so support sustainability transition across the European Union, for example, in terms of energy, without neglecting uh, vulnerable groups, without neglecting the low-income regions, for example. So the just transition is set up here precisely to support these lacking behind regions in the southern part of Europe, for example, or support vulnerable groups that that do not have the economic capacity to, for example, to transform the heating system in their, in their places towards uh, renewable energies, the just transition exists precisely to help everybody to uh, fit in the discourse of sustainability transition, not only discourse, but also further policies uh, in this supporting uh, sustainability transitions. And these are, again, mainly occurring within the energy and transportation sectors. One diagram summarizing all the components within the 
within the European uh, the European Green Deal, and uh, and uh, as a, as a, in the background of this deal, principles of slow innovation, principles of circular economy, place based approach to having policies very targeting specific needs of smaller uh, smaller territories, small and medium sized towns, for example. The principles of circular economy they are all attached or at the background of the deal. And the deal, how it will be operationalized, it will be operationalized through a circular economy action plan. You have the link here to a biodiversity strategy targeting some, some of these are the missions of the, or the submissions of the deal. So let's say um, carbon neutral uh, European territory towards 2050, and we have then the uh, submissions and a number of mission projects. Uh, circular economy, the farm to fork strategy, enhancing the local, the local uh, uh, local resources within the countries and the just uh, transition found trying to really bring all these uh, elements to uh, to all the citizens uh, a number of critical uh, uh, literatures can be found on the on the on the deal and they often question uh, what kind of financial mechanisms the countries will be able to use to truly support the implementation of the green deal to what extent this just transition fund will actually uh, help the vulnerable groups and the lagging behind regions to integrate this train already in the high speed uh, on the sustainability transitions, for example, at the energy front. So, and this, in practical terms, a lot needs to be done for this deal to, uh, to take shape in reality. And uh, as you also may understand, a number of uh, policies, the same, and then the deal is then disentangled in a number of uh, policy with specific targets, and I will not go into that uh, onto these, uh, onto these uh, policies or strategies. There are a number of uh, legislation that needs to come up to support the deal, uh, support the operationalization of the deal, then a number of, of uh, um, structural changes in terms of taxation, and carbon prices as well in adapting climate change legislation in uh, for example in implementing a circular economy within the industrial strategy so not outside of the industry they truly want to reshape business models of uh, the industry do the importance of uh, industry within the economic landscape of the european union it also impo uh, impacts or requires a number of transformations or if you want structural change within the within the transportation sector they call they call it the the the, the to, to embrace the more smart mobility manner which then requires also a change in terms of uh, the legislation impacting the transportation sector across uh, uh, the union railways and the combined transportation for example so it still it will take certainly a, a, a good amount of time until all this legislation is 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 implemented and then translated or or, or developed in the different member states based on their own principles, and um, we already start seeing some of these outputs of of uh, these more visionary perspectives supporting the green deal one of uh, them i shared with you two weeks ago i believe that this the, the communication from the european commission commission calling or or, or uh, calling um, or not not calling imposing somehow um to to uh, to the private sector that it's their products will only be able to enter the european union common market if they are deforestation free so if they prove that they are coming from a country and they uh, uh, and they 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 didn't need to 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 uh, to 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 support deforestation in this country to produce their their uh, their uh, their products and this in primarily impacts uh, commodity crops uh, commodity crops and also uh, and also soybeans uh, soybeans and beef coming from south america for example and it's, i'm very curious to see how this actually can be then be implemented in practice so the legislation is the uh, or the intention is out there is important now to come up and integrate these uh, these communications still the communication into legislation and then to have the mechanisms to truly control the private sector in this in this regard it's certainly a very ambitious uh, domain here supporting the deal but uh, a lot needs to be done to truly 
tracked if products are deforestation free or not. Again, a number of also legislation in terms of sustainability, a number of them need to be developed to truly support the deal. And here, the slide underlines that that uh, the the mostly the the costs of this uh, of uh, of uh, operationalizing the green deal, it entails a number of uh, of costs, and it's important to understand who will be able to to support this transition. For example, if the European Union will be able to financially support all the member states, and uh, understanding actually who will win with this. Uh, with this deal and if the deal will be actually able to, to, to support the sustainability transition uh, across the entire member states, including those lagging behind, uh, lying behind regions. So very ambitious aims within the deal and what it still uh, weakly, uh, weak explored or lagging behind in terms of, of uh, uh, implementation uh, relates to the founding scheme supporting the operationalization of, uh, of the deal. And in the end, the deal, uh, again, emphasizes most of the degrow and mission-oriented principles bottom up, is about also changing the way of life uh, completely. Maybe this is a bit of extreme. We We've been talking about the voluntary commitments, respecting democratical principles, also respecting the sovereignty, sovereignty of the countries as well. Not all the member states are uh, uh, open to integrate the European uh, legislation, and it certainly because requires a strong intervention from the private sector, mainly from the industry, is yet unclear how the private sector will engage with um, with the Green Deal. Um, here's some some of the questions that uh, that can come up with uh, when researching the deal and the, the interrelationship between the deal and other in other in the sustainability transitions, for example. And because this is the last lecture, and uh, before uh, uh, concluding, it's important that I give uh, some time to you uh, to debate or or if you have questions regarding the the seminar. In both cases, feel free to 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 ask and let's use these uh, four final minutes to, to clarify some of your doubts. We are only seven participants. And for those that are watching the lecture later, if you have uh, doubts, please uh, come up to me. And, uh, and uh, these are the forthcoming uh, deadlines that is important to, you know, they are different from for the um, international students. Uh, here is a mistake is for the students of the Master of Society, not the SRE students. These are with Professor Robert Ansik. So for the international students and students of the Master in of um, Science, Society and the Environment, uh, you know that the deadline is coming next uh, next week for you to share the topic and then receive uh, feedback um, as a response to that. And then follow the, the deadlines uh, with Professor Ansik regarding your, your topic. So do you have any question in this regarding regarding uh, regarding the lectures as well? While you think about and uh, and because you are often curious about um, examples in terms of uh, of some of these concepts the paper the paper that I um, I shared it with you last uh, last Friday, I believe, on the degrow in the context of sustainability transitions they bring uh, two examples of how the, these degrow principles are integrated in these two, uh, two activities. They actually do not specify uh, a location. They give a number of, uh, of examples uh, across Europe and elsewhere in the US as well, in terms of transition towns and cargonomia, the use of uh, bike sharing to um, in the logistical logistics sector. So I think it's a very interesting uh, article. So any question, any intervention in this regarding or? Uh, Hesse. I have, uh, sorry that it's a Please. bit noisy around myself here. <laughs> I hope you can uh, hear me properly. Um, so until the 8th, that means um, we can still send it throughout the day on the 8th to you, right? So probably 12 a.m. Yes. or something like that. Okay. Yes, I tell, I tell deadlines are often mid, are all midnight. I mean, I don't okay. the, it's not 6 p.m., it's not 9 p.m., it's end of the day is 8 until midnight. Okay, okay, thank you. And do you have yeah. generally any preference in, I don't know, a citation style or something like that? Um, no. Any guidelines no. or is that up to us? 
No, it's until until the eight. You can simply send a, a, an email with an with an idea. With a really, you don't need to put citations on the email of uh, uh, of the eighth of December. Okay, uh, you can just say, well, my idea is to explore um, this topic, uh, and and um, so you don't really need to to do something really evolved in this regard. It's just it's just a tentative uh, a tentative topic. It doesn't really need to be a tentative. Uh, title but if you have a, a solid a solid topic eventually a question that that is that is relevant bring it uh, uh, on that email on the on the hates you don't need to put citations and later on you are free to use the citation style you you want to i don't really call for any type of citation as far as you use citations and then list the references at the end okay thank you You're welcome yeah, so I have uh, I have two emails uh, pending um, regarding the topic, so uh, I will manage my time accordingly. But I I will certainly reply to all of you until until the fifteenth of uh, of December, and then we will go into into holidays. And if you prefer to ever ever chat online, I'm, I'm also open to do that. Although I prefer to communicate via by email, so I can manage all my tasks a little bit better. Okay, so I wish you a happy holidays, but before that, uh, uh, I hope you have uh, all enjoyed economic geography and sustainability, and uh, I've done my best to bring uh, uh, popular, well-discussed topics within economic geography and those that uh, are, in my perspective, better aligned with sustainability. Maybe other colleagues will ex all have explored the other topics. I think these are e e essential topics uh, within economic geography and sustainability, and uh, and but do not be again, again, uh, uh, again jailed in this uh, or don't jail your thoughts within these concepts. You are free to explore others and bring the in, bring also the values of your background into the into the essay topic and explore something that really engages you and motivates you to to write about. So that's why I do not want to, to, to somehow impose or share a topic from my research realm towards you because uh, my experience as a student and I'm still, I'm still partly uh, a student as I have to do exams to, for, 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 uh, um, to evolve in career that we need to engage with topics that we are more passionate about. So it's important that you find that niche and explore it um, the best, uh, the best you can. Okay. So, uh, any other question? All right. So, thank you so much for joining the lecture. Thank you so much for watching later, and how uh, I look forward to read your emails and interact with you via email uh, uh, in the in the coming. Uh, two months and or yeah in about two months okay from this from today until our seminar presentation day so all the best take good care okay take good care thank, thank you, you. Much. thank you so much bye bye, bye. thank you bye